we're seeing and what we might be seeing in the future uh, regarding fall of diseases of landscape plants. I'm gonna try to take up a little time because I think next uh, part about the pruning stuff and shrubs, uh, Dr. Gu is going to need a lot more time, and it, she, I think, actually incorporates some audience participation activities. Uh, so what I want to do is real quickly go through what is being seen around here in College Station around Central Texas, and I got some photos uh, uh, to share with you guys from taken from all over, actually. So if you, if you look at something like this, uh-oh, somebody better turn off the uh, 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 um, drawing the annotation. thing. Annotation. Hey, y'all, uh, if you're an attendee, please do not draw. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, uh, Kevin, why don't you un un unshare real quick and share, or actually it's Mung Mung, right? Can you un uh, unshare your screen and reshare it? And then I'll reset the annotation there. Uh, unfortunately, right. there's no, no quick or efficient way of disabling that. There we go. Are we good now? Perfect. We're good. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Uh, so, so one thing I do want to point out, the image on the right is something that I took yesterday at the Leach uh, Teaching Gardens here at, uh, uh, on the campus of Texas A&M. Uh, this is real typical of a, a lot of shrubs that are coming out after the cold incident that we had. Uh, you're going to get a lot of small leaf looking things and uh, they look yellow. The term is chlorosis, which they're not supposed to be that yellow. Um, most of the time they'll grow out a bit. It's not a problem. But what happened is on the left side is a picture of a, I believe a hydrangea. Yes, it's a hydrangea, which with a bunch of red spots on it. It looks like somebody took a BB gun with red dye and shot it. Well, I'm telling you more about this later. Go on to the next slide, please. Now, walking back uh, from the uh, gardens yesterday, I noticed this tree and it's one of a few um, that actually was yellow. I don't think it's supposed to be yellow because there are leaves there that are greener. Now, uh, for some of you, you may notice that there are shrubs, whether it's in a hedgerow or something, you might have one or two plants in there that are more yellow than others. And, and so the question always that we get is, what's wrong with it? Well, just to give you a little tidbit here, that yellowing, first thing that comes into your mind or should come into your mind is it's nutritional. The plant is not getting nutritional. Then the next question is, why are they not getting the nutrition? That is a more difficult answer to, uh, uh, question to answer. And we'll chat a little bit more about that. Let's move on to the next slide real quick. Now, these are some fun things that you are going to see or, or you already start seeing or will continue to see. On the left is a pine tree with basically tips dying up. Now, that particular one, hopefully you can notice it's a lot more red, more uniform in color. Um, that is more than likely result of what I think is, is damage to the buds during the cold, uh, abiotic type symptoms. Now. Uh, if you get situations like that with tip blight and so on, which we are getting quite a bit of reports, uh, most recently from far west Texas and, and, and the North Texas area, um, North being Lubbock, so the Rolling Plains area, uh, take a closer look at those leaves because uh, if it's a fungal effect on causing tip blight and so on, uh, you would have a tendency to see more banding on that pine leaf, that fine leaf, or um, uh, it'll be more of a golden straw color. Uh, sometimes under the just the uh, cloudy light, it might have a little tinge of gray in it. So keep that in mind. Um, many, again, many reasons that, that could contribute to symptoms like this. Um, over on the right is boxwood. Uh, we see quite a bit of this having tips back. Yeah, on, on, on the right, that tips, uh, that, that seems to die off. Now, the interesting part is, the question comes up is, is it abiotic or is it biotic? Is it a fungus? Could a fungus cause something like this? Uh, yes, it could. Um, one of the more uh, uh, 
pro one of the problems that are getting worse and worse, I think, in a lot of urban areas, uh, is this thing called uh, 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 stem canker um, caused by Calcotrichum, Theobromicla. Um, we do have that in Texas. It was uh, identified a bunch of years ago in Louisiana. Uh, but we, what we do find with this one, or at least true research that have been done, that if there is some form of stress, environmental stress, whether it's freeze or um, extreme heat, where you get damage on the wood itself or the branches, then you actually um, would have those sort of infestation or infection uh, resulting in those tip dieback. Um, what do you do in this situation? Is it water? Is it uh, that, that theobromicla? Is it something else? Well, I would say take a look at those branches in there. Uh, chances are, if it's a uh, uh, colotarticum, you'll find some form of canker. So that branch actually will have a crack in there or something to indicate that there was an opening for that fungus to attack it. Um, in the last two years or so, this has become a, a, a pretty uh, common problem that uh, we're getting reports of from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, flip to the next slide, please. All right, these are things that you guys might see pretty commonly if you take walks around. And I actually took those pictures uh, in walks. On the left side, uh, uh, you, you'll see those uh, type of uh, red spotty symptoms on red tips on Indian hawthorns, if you still have any of those alive uh, uh, from the coal. And I think, what is it? You, you'll see that on ligustrums too. That's usually the, the start of a, 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 a leaf spot uh, caused by a, a Sacospora. Uh, there are several other fungal leaf spots that can cause a, a similar type symptoms with that uh, uh, purpling and so on. Uh, Entomosporium is one that is, is pretty commonly found. And, and remember that purple coloring there is an expression of anthocyanins in those um, um, leaves, which is actually a stress response. So if you want to create those purple spots without the fungus, you can use really cold water and spray a fine mist on there and you can cause little tiny uh, uh, red spots on some varieties of Fatinius and, and, and Indian Hawthorne. Just little things to mess with people, you know. Uh, uh, but I'll also tell you how to look for if it's a fungus and, and what to do about it. On the right, we are seeing uh, 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 roses doing very well this year, uh, but in areas that is high humidity and so on, we are starting to see um, uh, incidences of black spots showing up. Uh, what I have on the right there is just uh, um, on a variety that has some resistance to it. So it's, it's um, the whole leaf is not covered in that black spot. And in fact, in that kind of light, uh, the, the spot looks almost brown. But if you look at the edge, it's, it's kind of feathery and it's black. So that's another thing that you can expect to see. And if we continue to stay humid or this is a, in a garden type environment that is getting ample uh, irrigation and so on. Um, we'll probably run into that. And again, remember with roses, as you got some varieties that are more resistant than others. So it's going to be dependent on, on the microenvironment uh, where the plant is. Uh, let's flip to the next one. Uh, well, hey, there's another one um, um, on the right. Um, pictures there is Entomosporium leaf spot. Um, and again, you, you see the spot with that purpling in there. Now, what I didn't show you is a close-up that when you look at that spot, um, there are going to be some indications there that would suggest that it's a, it's a fungus. And uh, if you do have a microscope, you can grab that and, and, and put that and make a, what we call a wet mount. And you can see some pretty cool looking spores. On the left side is, is uh, uh, what we would typically call entracnose. Uh, and tragnose tends to show up more when it gets warmer. So we, we are starting to see some of it here. Uh, I anticipate that if we continue, well, we got quite a bit of water uh, in, in many parts of Texas uh, the last couple of months. So there is enough humidity there, but this is going to show up more and more in areas that might get good irrigation. So when you think about urban landscapes, 
um, you're going to see this show up on, on, on your Dracaenas, your uh, uh, potentially your monkey grass, your ivies and so on. And I do believe I have a, a picture on ivy on the next slide. And again, on the left, that, that's Entragnos. That was a really nice one that I took a bunch of years ago at the Alamo. Uh, uh, and, 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 and the one on the right is actually some damage on um, uh, one of the fan palms. That's it. Uh, and, and the spots there, um, we might call it Entragnos, but actually it's going to be uh, uh, caused by a fungus called Graffiola. Again, there will be little tricks to, to find out whether it's a, a, a fungus or not. Uh, let's see, next slide will actually give that, that, that kicker there. Now, if you guys remember the earlier pictures with the yellowing and, and, and some of the red spots, one of the, the, the questions we get is, is it a fungal leaf spot? It, uh, it, you know, or is it abiotic? How do you know if it's a, it's a fungal leaf spot? Um, a lot of the fungal pathogens that causes uh, leaf spots or basically infests or infect leaves uh, will produce what we know as fruiting bodies, where they will produce more spores to cause new infection. And if you catch it at the right time, which is probably far along, what you would tend to see are those fruiting body structures in the middle of what we call the lesion, the damage. And so on the left side, this was a picture that I took, oh, I don't know how many years ago, off one of a, I think it was a palm tree or something like that, maybe it was a crab apple. Uh, but if you see those black dots in there, unfortunately, this is a 2D picture. In 3D, actually, when you look at it at a certain angle, those black spots are somewhat raised. Think about it as a black head on a face. You know, you can literally pop it. Now, little trick here. Run your fingers across it. If it rolls right off, you just roll off insect poop. But if it, you, you, you pick off some stuff, but the black stuff is still there, that's a fungal fruiting body. Um, on the right is a, a, a sample that we got in not too long ago, Magnolia. And if you look at those lesions there, you can actually see some of those black spots in there. Um, I'm showing black spots because they show up really good in picture and they stand out. And realize those fruiting bodies, um, they could be white tufts, they could be uh, uh, a slightly brown or, 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 or yellow protruding uh, structures. So you can have a, a, a varied color there. Uh, but the main thing here is if you see some damage on the leaf and you wonder if it's fungus, eh, if you're lucky and, and it, the, 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 the thing is, uh, has been around for a while, look at those lesions and if you see bumps on it, you see obvious something that's not supposed to be there, uh, black, black heads on it, more than likely it's a fungus. Um, now I wanna move on to uh, uh, show you a different contrast in color. Uh, next one over. And most of you will recognize this as a uh, uh, powdery mildew. Um, we have not seen this, um, in this sort of fashion yet, I did notice on some susceptible roses that we are starting to see a little bit of, of powdery mildew coming in. And one interesting about powdery mildew uh, is that uh, when, it, you might not see that white stuff on there, but especially with roses, um, you get that gnarly looking growth. In other words, where it's feeding on that leaf, that leaf is not going to grow properly, so you get a, malformed, abnormal looking uh, foliage. And then the white stuff, that powdery stuff shows up later. Now, this is, uh, we often associate this with, with more of a summer type disease when there is ample humidity. Uh, the image on the left is on crab myrtle. This was taken in Atlanta at the Centennial Park. They got a bunch of crab myrtle there that was just covered in white uh, at that time. I was so excited as a plant pathologist, you know? Um, uh, and, and, and the one on the right is actually on a, uh, oak. Yes, that was, a. I believe that was a burr oak. And I think I took that up near your neck of the neighborhood, uh, somewhere in Fort Worth. Either that or in Denton, I couldn't remember. Um, but you do get those tufts that are often going to be white or off-white, grayish white. 
a um, couple of interesting notes. If you guys have a microscope to play with, take a look at it, especially at the end of the season, because this type of fungi, uh, there's eight different genera that would, would, would cause powdery mildew, will produce a, a scoma or cleistothesia, which really look like a World War II underwater mine uh, um, uh, uh, that will kind of sit on those uh, white fluffy things. So that's something for you to, to, to take a look at. I'm gonna switch gears and talk about a different pathogen. One that I really enjoy uh, is, is um, uh, bacterial, bacterial pathogens. So many years ago, I, and I believe this, I took the picture on the left of a red bud with some bacterial spots. And in fact, we use that as a, uh, on one of our Valentine cards from the clinic because it was so cool having disease on a heart-shaped leaf. Uh, and then on the right, um, you can obviously see that rot. The one thing to point out with bacterial stuff on leaves is you are going to have that water soak appearance. So it's gonna look like somebody took hot oil and splash it on, on, on a piece of paper so you get that translucent effect of it. Uh, it's more obvious uh, on that, uh, what is it, elephant ears on the right uh, than the uh, red bar on the left. But when you look at the underside of it, you can actually see what it looks like when it's uh, water soaked. Now, the other thing to point out, and this is not true with all bacterial pathogens on leaves, if you tend to get a spot of blotch, um, oftentimes they might produce that yellow halo around the lesion. Uh, partly because when, when bacterial grows, they ex exude out a bunch of things that they produce, and some of it um, um, is going to help them to colonize that, that plant material better. And, and, and so it may have toxins that will break down chlorophyll. So that's why you tend to see some of that halloing, uh, yellowing, chlorotic type uh, 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 symptoms uh, when you deal with uh, bacterial type issues. Um, let's go to the next one. Dr. Ong, um, I, I don't think that's a uh, elephant ear. Uh, that, that's, that looks more like a, Vegetarious? a, a syngonium. That looks syngonium, more like thank you. Syngonium. That's right. You are correct. I knew I forgot something. That's why always good to have a horticulturist as a good friend. I'm a plant disease guy. All right, this one is cool. Do I know what's going on here? No, but guess what? I think it's a virus. Have I checked it out to make sure it's a virus? Nope, but I can tell you this, we didn't get fungus, so we didn't get bacteria out of this. And, and so sometimes we get real funky symptoms such as this. Um, um, Initially, I, I suspected this to be something like impatience of chronic uh, uh, spot virus, which commonly would cause uh, uh, some ring spots on ornamentals. We see that on coleus, we see that on, uh, in fact, uh, oh, what's it, impatience, uh, but not something like this on Fotinia before. So I uh, just wanna point out that there are some funky, cool symptoms out there. Uh, when I first saw this, I thought, hey, it could be fungal because of that, that spot where you see the concentric circles, which is very common when you have a fungal infection. Uh, but the fact that you have all uh, 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 varying degrees of that, that ring spotting there um, and inability of us to recover any fungal agents uh, would suggest something otherwise. Now, I wanna show you one more slide, then we'll talk a little bit about, about solutions in general. Now, this one's uh, kind of fun because uh, it's what we got in the clinic on the left, that's uh, a holly. Um, um, I think when the person who sent it in thought it might be powdery mildew. Now, we haven't really seen powdery mildew on hollies, but what that person actually had was a really bad infestation of scale insects. Uh, and, and then on the right, you know, some people might say, whoa, that looks like rust. That's a citrus plant. Uh, but in fact, what you see with that orange stuff there, it's not rust, but it is a fungus. But guess what? It's a good fungus. 
guess what the fungus is doing? It's feeding on scale insects that were on the citrus plant, uh, which is really kind of funny. You can scrape that thing off and, and you have a perfectly fine leaf on the, uh, underneath all that. So just to show you that there are some funky things happening there uh, on, on one end on the left side where you have an infestation of scale that could totally destroy that plant if it's not dealt with. And on the right is a, a, a form of nature's way of protecting the plant by using a fungus against the scale before the scale could do too much damage to that citrus plant. So let's rewind all those and say, what do you do if you deal with a fungus? How, how can you, uh, uh, um, what sort of approach you can take in terms, you know, uh, in a landscape business and, and, and doing stuff. Now, obviously most clients will want something to be done, something to be sprayed, uh, the problem to be fixed uh, yesterday. Couple of things to keep in mind. Damage that is done. If the plant tissue is dead, there is nothing short of green paint to make that leaf tissue green again. Uh, so pruning might be a good solution to make it look pretty again quickly. Uh, but ultimately, on the long run, you have to consider the environmental conditions and what you can do to modify those environmental conditions to prevent future uh, onset or actually expansion of the, uh, um, of the pathogen having the ability to cause more damage. So those are the sort of a, the, the two things to keep in mind. One is dead tissue is not going to be revived. Second thing is for the long term, you need to look at the holistic approach of it. Now, the short term approach, what do you do? What fungicides can you use? And remember, fungicides are going to be there to slow down, to stop the onset of uh, uh, whether it's an infection or the progression of that infection. Um, um, for the most part, uh, the chemicals that are available to you guys commercial side, uh, mostly um, systemic. So things like your tabiconazoles, so that's your trazoles, uh, your um, uh, strobilurins, uh, things like heritage, pyraclostrobin, uh, even boscalate would be, be grouped in that uh, area, uh, propiconazoles, uh, microbutanil, I think that's eagle. Um, those are all broad spectrum. So in some sense, uh, they have some activity against most fungi. They do better on some than others, but keep in mind, most of this, even though it's systemic, it goes in, it stops, it slows down the growth of that fungus, and it protects new growth from new infection. We still have some good broad spectrum old uh, uh, type chemicals or, or protectants out there, things like your chlorothalonil, uh, which you can get pretty uh, um, easily with, with um, um, this brand name is Dacmil, but that's a whole bunch of generics out there, uh, as well as Mancazep. Uh, th that's another multi-site uh, chemical that, that have really good uh, broad spectrum range, but they are protectants. So they work best, again, as a, a protectant uh, put down to protect new growth from being infected. So couple of things to keep in mind here. When you have problems already occurring, if you take care of the environment and then you, you, you use a protectant, assuming that the infection is not internal, then it would be fine. But if it's going to be a vascular type uh, uh, um, issue, things like would be causing will or things like the colitotricum that, that's causing the uh, uh, what we call stamp canker on the boxwood, a systemic would be better in that part because remember putting a protectant like dacanil is not, that's not gonna penetrate into or picked up by the plants and distribute within the plant. So you want something that can get it the plant. Now, those are just a, a couple of things to think about. Bacterial, uh, bacterial pathogens are a little bit more difficult to deal with, but keep in mind the environment is a beautiful thing. You get things dry, usually bacterial problem goes away. Um, but 
to protect new growth from bacterial infection. And oftentimes this is going to be from splashing where the bacteria will get on the uh, plant itself and, and enter through a stomate or some other opening. Copper fungicides work really well. Uh, I think they do sell antibiotics for that. That's not very common. I think that's um, mostly that's for like fire blight on, on some of those uh, uh, trees and bloom during the time. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about copper fungicides, there are many different uh, uh, brands out there, uh, different formulations. You got to be careful with copper fungicides. Um, if you use too much of it, and in some sense, it can turn some of your stuff blue, and even worse, in some cases, can cause burns. So, so read the label real carefully on that. Um, the, the good part is they are an, an inexpensive uh, uh, product that, that can be used. And furthermore, they do have activity against uh, uh, some uh, fungi. Uh, so keep that in mind. It's, it's a sort of a multi-use type approach. Um, what about viruses? Well, the bad part about viruses is we don't have an antiviral product uh, that we can inject or spray on a plant uh, that will help a plant recover from, from, from a virus infection. So the question that we often run into is what's the biological significance of that virus itself? Uh, in some sense, you know, we could say, hey, it, it, it gives a great phenotype. You know, hey, person, you have a unique garden here that your neighbor does not. Um, but at the same time, there are some viruses that will basically result in death, eventual death of the plant itself and also poor plant health. Uh, in those type of situations, depending on the type of virus, what's important to know is how it's being spread. If it's being spread by an insect, then a strategy uh, is to basically deal with the insect vector, prevent spread. If that is being moved through roots, then you want to make sure that you remove plants um, that may be infected in a bed so it doesn't get to the other plants and create a buffer. Uh, so keep in mind here, it, 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 uh, trying to get a good identification of what the virus is and how it moves will help you figure out what is an appropriate approach to take to get some good or, or decent uh, uh, control management uh, against that particular disease. Then the last one on this slide with the insects and so on, Obviously, when you start to have an infestation, uh, uh, you'll need to take care of that insect itself. Now, on the right side, um, the gentleman that, that shared with us that plant asked me what to do about it and I, uh, with his citrus plants. And I, I look at him, I said, well, you have a scale problem. Do you still have a scale problem? He says, no, but I have this red rust problem now. I said, well, it could affect your fruiting because it does take up some space on the leaf and reduce photosynthesis. You could wash it off if you want, but I basically told him not to use any fungicide on it. A broad spectrum would probably kill it, but then if he did that, guess what? His scale problem would come back. And he's at a point right now where he's not seeing a lot of scale but he's seeing a lot of this. So we do have a natural uh, biological agent out in his hobby farm. So this is one of those situations where I said, hey, if you don't mind the look, leave it. Let nature take its course. Okay, with, with that, I am gonna quit here and I'm gonna try and jump off to another meeting and, and turn this time over to Mang Mang Gu. No, no, over, no, Mang don't Gu. leave yet. We have a question for you. Oh, uh, there is? Yeah, okay. the uh, Why don't you, you know, leave me you alone? Know, no, the uh, the disease triangle. One of the thing is, uh, you know, is the host plants with the uh, winter storm killing so many plants. Uh, you know, like like the Indian hawthorns and stuff like that. So, so what's your pr prediction? What's your prediction for the disease? You know, for next spring. I'll tell you what. No plants, no problem. You want to put Indian hawthorn again? You can bet you you'll see some disease showing up because those pathogens are really wily. They will hide somewhere. 
okay, all right. Well, thank you, Dr. Ong. I, I know that you have to run. Run. Good, you're going to leave me alone now? Yes, I'm going to leave you, you alone. alone. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Well, and you know, our, our big pathogen on Indian Hawthorne, the Entomosporium leaf spot, which is my, I, my choice for the cutest spores, truthfully. They're really cute. Um, but, uh, you know, it has so many other hosts too, uh, Photinias, and yeah, so you're, you know, you're not going to get rid of it completely. Oh, by the way, Laura, Laura Miller, I appreciate you calling it a cute spore. It's and if you don't spore. know what, and if you guys don't know what she's talking about, find a picture of it. I think we actually have a picture of it on our, our Facebook page at the plant clinic. And, you know, it just looked like two big mice, two little mice in a huddle. Thank you. Hey, all right. Ong. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ong. We're going to move on. We're going to move on from Dr. Ong. <laughs> the other thing that really struck me, oh, well, before we talk about pruning, was the, the little trick for telling whether you had poop or spores. You know, I thought that was yeah. pretty clever. Yeah. yeah. So, you know. All right. Let's, uh, let's take your uh, cell phones. Let's take your cell phones out and uh, text Mung Mung Goo. 693 to 22-333. <laughs> I'm not trying to sell you anything, uh, but I was hoping, you know, by the end of this presentation, hey, at least, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we, we get uh, one of your questions answered. Uh, you know, if you always have question about pruning something, something, uh, put your something, something here. So text, so first you need a text uh, Mang Mangu 693. I don't know why they uh, picked something this long for me. <laughs> uh, so, so first pick that, you know, text that to join and then text your uh, message. Ooh, azaleas. Okay. Well, we know it works. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, yes, yes. We know it works. <laughs> My life problems. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Cannot be. That was me just. That was me just checking. Oh, you're just checking. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you thank can't you for solve checking. Those with falco shears. Yes, just, I've tried. It doesn't work. Not that you know of. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So uh, if, uh, if, 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 uh, let me see, if, if we don't have any question about pruning, I guess we could just stop here. <laughs> Instead of going through all the uh, slides, that I guess we could just stop at roses, viburnums, and azaleas. Oh, <laughs> uh, you guys and my are life so... problems. Yes. And, and yes. life problems. Yes. Y'all are so kind. Uh, you, know, that, you know, yes. On the life problems, I'm, I'm stalling here so someone else can text in, but. On the life problems things, I do think you have to be in a certain frame of mind to do a good job pruning. Like you have to kind of gear yourself up for cutting like that. You know, it's sort of like surgery or something. You gotta get, you gotta it's get true. in the, You need to wait for the, the right season. Mode. You have to wait yeah. for the right season to do that pruning. Yeah. You got, but also the right mental, mental state. Mental you know? season. Mental yeah. state. You know? <laughs> mental season. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, mental. Okay. Season. All right. The We're right motivational the shears. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. We're gonna see the slides. We're gonna see the slides. Okay. All right. Just... I I can't see somebody. The somebody have uh, two inputs in the chat, but I can't see it. Oh, it was it was. I would like to see the slides. <laughs> oh, I like to see the slides. <laughs> Should I murder my crepe myrtle? No. <laughs> so uh, so so the the next one is uh you know let's let's let let's uh let's see some uh what are you know some of the reasons for a shrub pruning. Uh, you know, A, prune off dead parts, prune off diseased insect infested parts. The parts, it could be, you know, stems, leaves, flowers, and stuff like that. Rejuvenate. Um, D is, uh, you know, make some meatballs. Uh, Y'all probably see you know, plenty of meatballs in the uh, landscapes. You know, the E is, it doesn't flower if I don't prune it. And F is none of the above. So uh, you have many choices. You have. I mean, you, what I'm saying is, this is a this is this is a multiple choice. You can select all that. You know, select all that applies. So we're just gonna wait for about thirty seconds for all the answers uh, coming in. 
And I'm going to guess that this year, A is really happening out there. <laughs> I mean, there is a lot of A going on. So um, uh, an example is, uh, you know, after ripping off the Indian hawthorns from our own landscapes, uh, my husband advised our neighbor to, hey, you know, <laughs> So my neighbor, uh, my neighbor ripped off uh, their uh, Indian hawthorns too. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, this year, that that the number A is uh, is is probably a lot of pruning uh, that, um, which is which is which is which is. Um, which is interesting that for, let's say for, for healthy plants, uh, for healthy plants, um, I think that may be, um, maybe the, um, the biggest reason to prune. Mm -hmm. Can somebody tell me what's going on in the chat? <laughs> yeah, I'm hearing winter storm damage. Um, let's see what else is happening in the chat. Got an um, ABC in there. Yeah, ABC. ABC got ABC in there. Yeah, which are all which are all right. Yeah, which all right. Okay, all right. You guys ready to see the responses? Let's yes. see it. <laughs> okay, so we don't wow. have any we don't have any meatball fans here. Today. Wow, yeah, we don't have we we don't have any meatball fans, and we don't have well, the, the pizza. Uh, the pizza shrub doesn't do well in Texas. <laughs> the pizza shrub. The, the pizza and Italian shrubs don't do very well. So yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, I just like well, yeah, prune off uh, the dead parts. The uh, you know, prune off prune off the uh, diseased insect infested parts and rejuvenate. Um, all right. So, so uh, I mean, uh, you all have seen, if you have been on uh, the previous uh, chat with the Green Aggies, and you're probably familiar with this slide, uh, after the uh, winter storm, after the winter storm, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, dead plant parts, uh, you know, in our, in our landscapes. And I say plant parts, uh, you know, in, in some cases, uh, well, in, in, this, in this slide, you see the dwarf oleander, you see the uh, bottle brush, you see the Indian hawthorns, and also on this side, you see this uh, um, uh, sago palm. So, so the, one of the reasons that I did not use, you know, dead branches is because, you know, for, for, for these, for, for sago palms and for many palms, you know, what the dead part is actually the, you know, the foliage, the, the, the leaves. And of course, you know, for these, for these three, these are the, um, you know, the dead stems or leaves, or maybe even, you know, to the roots. Um, so, and you probably have seen this one, you know, dead or not, this is one way to check uh, whether, you know, check on the stem, whether, you know, on the left side, the brown is dead and the, on the right side, the green, you know, that's, uh, that's still alive. So that will be a, uh, that will be a, uh, you know, a, a way to, to, to show, to show that, the, you know, whether uh, that's dead need to be pruned off or that's not so dead. Um, even, even, even at this time, even at this time, I know that we're already over a month uh, past the winter storm. I would still recommend that uh, we kind of wait we kind of wait a little bit. And um, because even I have shown this to many uh, of my friends, but you know, even with a trained eye, sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes it's just not that easy to, to this, is, this is like a day and night, but then there's these between this ground, this brownish green and this, you know, then there's also it's this kind of transition. So, so it may not be as easy as we think, you know, to tell the difference between alive and dead. And, and that actually happened on my own um, wax myrtle, on my own wax myrtle that I thought it was dead. And then I even did this uh, test and it was brown. But then you look now uh, way at the top there, there are some green leaves uh, showing up. So with that, you know, you know it's uh, not necessarily dead. So um, 
there are uh, there are a lot of uh, we're uh, in Texas. You know, the weather and everything. We're blessed with a lot of plant materials. Well, there are there are too many plant materials to be included. You know, in the slide to to try to show them all. But what I did is uh, I, I tried to group these plants. I tried to group these plants based on their uses, you know, whether they flower, when they flower, uh, what their growth habit is, you know, uh, and stuff like that. So I grouped them into these little groups. And, and also I think, you know, it's just fun to show uh, some of the, you know, some of the, the plant pictures. I do have to give credits to two Texas nurseries that uh, these, uh, uh, I, I have many plant pictures, uh, but the thing is, you know, if if uh, if they're not available from uh, Texas uh, nurseries or you know surrounding nurseries, um, it's it's a moot point. You know, if we can't get those plant materials, that's not so. That's the main reason that I you know choose to copy um, uh, the plant pictures from these two nurseries. Um, so one is the uh, Magnolia Nurseries in uh, Magnolia Nursery Gardens in uh, Waller, Texas, and then the other one is uh, uh, Native Texas Nursery in Austin area. So for the early for the early flowering um, for the early flowering ones, uh, the early flowering number one. So these are group the a group of plants that you all know that they flower on the previous on the previous year's growth and they have to go through that cold period of time. And the reason I put these are as group one is because uh, um, I know some camellias, they may have a, a very, um, Laura, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> um, tidy, they may have, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> tidy. That's, that's actually not the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Compact. What do you what do you want to say? The neat free world? spirit, yeah. free spirit. I guess. No, you so, want to say the free spirited kind the, the, of. World. Yes. Um, yeah, so so you know so okay. so especially here you know like the flowering quince like the flowering wow. quince you you just don't know where you know where the the stems are going so so yep, you know yep, so, free spirit. Yeah. You, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, you know, so compared to the next group, which I'm going to show the picture later, you know, so, you know, they, again, so they flower early in the, in the spring, in, you know, in the spring. So you don't, uh, you definitely don't want to, you know, you definitely don't want to uh, uh, prune these uh, before they flower. Well, and just, well, actually for any, for basically for any uh, uh, flowering shrubs, um, it's, you, you it's it's not recommended to prune them before they flower definitely um so so you know these you know uh and sometimes you're like i i don't know when they flower so you know might as just wait so some of these uh plants that you know they flower in the early springtime so uh early spring is not a good time and and actually plants will have cues you know plants will have cues for you and often, you know, before they flower, you'll see these uh, big swelling buds. You know, those buds are very different, much bigger than their normal leaf buds. And, and, and uh, so those are the flower buds that, uh, you know, um, definitely if you prune those off and you're not gonna have flowers this year. So um, I'm gonna show this group of plants. So this group of plants are, um, are you know spring flower? They're also spring flower. Uh, they're compared to the the uh, the group of plants from the previous page. That this group of plants they actually have a very tidy uh, look. Um, you know they're not necessarily as tidy as as the meatballs. You know not necessarily as tight as meatballs, but still you know they're making a, a pretty round. They have a dense. Uh, they have a very dense growth habit. So, so um, this could be, you know, used in, uh, in uh, you know, as a hedge, as a, as a screen in, you know, or as a backdrop. Um, so after flowering, you know, if you want to not necessarily make a meatball out of it, not necessarily make a meatball out of it, but just make it look slightly, you know, tidy, slightly neat. And you know, after flower, these could probably be uh, be pruned. Versus this group of plants, versus this group of plants, 
I would just recommend, you know, just, you know, in terms of um, making, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, making them look tight and look as, you know, where you want them to be, this may be hard. So this is where, you know, plant selection may be important for you. You know, if you want that more, um, more, uh, more uniform look, you know, maybe you should uh, choose some plants from this, uh, from this, um, uh, from this group. And you guys probably know that uh, on the market, there are a lot of reblooming, uh, a lot of reblooming azaleas. So for those, they get a first flush of flowers. But then, you know, instead of just for the one season, so they still continuously uh, flower in the, in the summer, you know, when the condition, when the condition is good for them. So in the, in the summer and in the fall, so watch for uh, for those azaleas. Uh, you know, just um, you may want to, if you want, you know, uh, prune off the spent flowers. Um, you know, that that's the spent flowers is also what I would call the dead parts. You know, those are um, if you have the, uh, you know, if your client is willing to pay for your labor. And I think that's where, uh, that's when you could do it. You know, if they're willing to pay, you know, your labor to uh, prune off the dead part, the spent flowers, totally do it. Uh, it will, uh, of course, you know, uh, prevent the, the, the spent flowers going to seeds, uh, you know, reduce the, the amount of energy going to, uh, you know, going to either seeds or going just, you know, the, the latter part of flowering. So, uh, uh, do that, uh, but it is it is definitely a labor to be a uh, uh, you know to be to be a spent and definitely charge for that uh, for that labor. So this is a, a late flowering. So these uh, on these plants um, on these plants that uh, uh, you know they flower on this year's woods. Um, so very different from that one uh, from the first, from the early flowering group of plants. And, and similarly, I group these, uh, you know, by their uh, how 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 uh, dense uh, their canopy is, how tidy they are, you know, in their growth habit. Um, as you can see, that you know, some of these uh, plants they could be um, uh, free spirit. And then similar to the early flowering ones, um, you know, some of these are, uh, you know, if you um, you know, the spent flowers are always okay to be pruned off if your client is, is willing to pay for that. But otherwise, um, I'll just use, uh, use uh, uh, Vitex as an example. Uh, if you prune off the spent flowers, there is a, a better chance, there is a better chance to get the second flush of flowers. So if your client is willing to pay for that, uh, definitely go for that. Um, I was also going to say this year, a lot of these um, subtropical plants have frozen, you know, back to the ground. So, but they, most of them are root hardy, like my pomegranate, my little dwarf pomegranates coming out from the roots. If I had oleanders, they would probably be coming out from the roots. So all of those will go ahead and flower, even though that they went all the way back to the ground, they'll usually, and pride of Barbados in North Texas always flowers, even though it freezes back every year. So. Those, well, because yeah, because they flower on the same year, same growth. year's root wood, right? So, so yeah. they get, so if they can just get off and get growing once it gets warm, they'll they'll go ahead and do their thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the the oleanders in uh, College Station area is is you know is um, they're in a similar situation like those um, uh, Indian hawthorns. They're not necessarily dead. Their roots are probably still um, their roots are probably still viable. But a lot of landscapes are, you know, the in the the oleanders and Indian hawthorns are being ripped off from the landscapes. I think uh, people are, you know, there's a chance that people are using this as an as a as an opportunity to install, you know, newer plants, um, you know, instead of just the plants that they inherited from the previous owner. So this is, yeah, this is an opportunity, uh, definitely. Um, and as, uh, I guess, as, as a nerd, you know, as the, uh, a landscape professional, this is where you could pitch, you know, you, you could pitch your, uh, you know, uh, 
your uh, you know sell, it's your selling point you know as the either the commercial landscape or the residential uh, landscape you know to put on a new look you know to put on the new look of the of the landscape but of course if you it, find plant material because I was, gonna, I was just gonna say that yes I was just gonna say that if you can find if you can find the new uh, plant material that's exactly what I was gonna say um uh, these are more. Uh, these are more. Uh, the late flowering ones. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of you know tidy ones. You know the meatball types, but uh, we got more free spirit in the in the late flowering ones. Uh, the giant coral bean, the 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 bar, uh, bar, uh, bar, dwarf Barbados uh, cherry, agarita, uh, coral berry, the kidney wood, the American beauty berry. Um, and then the uh, the yellow bells, the different type of uh, yellow bells, and the the the, the tree cena. So these are um, this is called tree cena, but I think it's more shrubby looking. So these these are they're all you know um, flowering. I mean flowering on the current year uh, on the current year growth. And in in some cases, you know, like the coral berry, like the uh, the coral berry, the uh, the agarita, the uh, the Barbados cherry. And also the American beauty berry, um, you know. After flower, they have these fruits. Uh, they have these fruits that that's really pretty, and and also you know would be good for uh, for wildlife. So you know it just not just almost uh, you know I, I mean almost never a, a, a reason for pruning this, you know, almost just a never a reason for pruning this. And I mean, unless it's going too wild in the landscape that you want to control the size a little bit. And of course, for for the American beauty berry, uh, if, if, I'm, I'm only saying if, if that your, uh, you know, American beauty berry is infested with a uh, cranberry bark scale, then that may be a good reason to prune. But uh, but otherwise, you know, uh, I would say leave the American beauty berries alone. You know, enjoy the spring flowers and then the uh, fruits in the fall. So these are late flowerings. Oh, this is a, this is another group of late flowerings. So these are uh, they're not necessarily meatballs, but they have very tight uh, uh, canopy. They have very tight canopy and uh, uh, and 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 you know very. Uh, uh, tidy uh, uniform uh, growth habit. Uh, sorry, I, I include this uh, sunshine lagustrum. It doesn't really flower that much, but it's it's in you know it has similar shape and pruning er, you know efforts if needed as as the uh, Laurel Petalums, as the abelias, as the uh, you know Texas sage. And if you think about all these plants, you know they flower on the same year on the same uh, on the uh, New Year growth. And they're very tidy, uh, very tidy. And so they are, um, what do you call it? I will call them a, a pruning tolerant. Uh, they're, uh, they're very forgiving, but that's not necessarily, but that's not necessarily a reason for pruning. Um, so what happened is, what happened is, so for these plants, you know, since there's, you know, they flower on the new growth. So the same year, a pruning would not affect it, uh, you know, it was still a flower. Um, the way it affected is, you know, if you nip off these, uh, these, uh, these growing tips and then, you know, the side shoes will come out. And uh, so for the side shoes to come out, um, you know, they will take some time to grow and, you know, and then to, again, not on this one, but on these, you know, what the, well, the flowers will come slightly later than if you did not prune off the uh, the tip. So there is a uh, there is a slight chance, you know, there is a small difference between when they're going to flower. But you know, uh, in a good time, they're still going to flower. And if you prune off the tips, it will make the plants look fuller, you know, look tighter. Or um, so. So this is true. I mean, except the flowering, there's no flowers on sunshine like shrimp, but the pruning on all these type of uh, um, plants would do that trick, make them, uh, make them tighter, and then the flowering will be delayed only slightly. Laura, do you have something to add to this group? 
I would just say that that um, Laura Petalum was the plant that the waiting has kind of worked out on in Dallas Fort Worth because it it looked dead like two weeks ago and now they're just coming out so you know I really thought we were going to completely lose those from the landscape but they're 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 coming out yeah um, yep 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 uh definitely <laughs> thank you for pointing that out <laughs> the waiting uh, the waiting. waiting it's 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 worth it the waiting mm -hmm. uh, so, so for these, uh, um, yeah. I also okay. think Texas sage, we see a lot of old, older planted ones, like the newer and the cultivar ones like um, Lens Legacy or, or Green Cloud or Purple Cloud are tighter plants, but some of the old species are kind of rangy and, you know, a little hard to prune, but, um, but the, the newer cultivars are improved in their form. Yes, uh, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. Uh, two of my neighbors, uh, two of my neighbors with the old ones, that's like uh, 10 feet tall or, you know, 10, with, 15 with feet 12 tall. 12 leaves on it right now. Yes, yeah. yes, not, yes, not yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. It's, it's all the leaves and flower all at the top. And then, you know, bottom is like uh, naked chicken legs and uh, <laughs> <laughs> not looking that great and I think their choice was you know just just simply just just cut it off and replace it with the uh, the newer cultivars so mm -hmm. so yes I totally agree with you so roses are roses <laughs> Laura you're ready <laughs> sure let's talk about these roses yeah so traditionally we prune roses around around Valentine's Day mid-February and we prune them pretty hard um um, and we did talk about that back in February and those who procrastinated, it probably kind of paid off, but actually all my roses are looking fine after the, after the cold weather, except for Lady Banks. Um, yeah, roses are actually looking great, Becky, all over, all over North Texas. Lady Banks is the one that is just, it's not dead, but it sure didn't bloom this year. So it, it's looking pretty rough, um, of, of the ones that I have. The second time that we prune roses typically in Texas is a really horrible time to be outdoors. But in August, if you will go out and do what is maybe uh, defined as like really aggressive deadheading where you go out and, you know, kind of clean up a bit and cut back. Oh, I don't know, maybe four to six inches on your on your plants, you'll get a nicer fall flush. And we usually do have a really nice flush of roses in October or so. Um, we'll usually have that that weather where they'll really, you know, do their thing again. So um, even even the constantly blooming ones like the knockouts will sort of slow down in August. And so it's a good time to get out there and kind of kind of trim back a little bit. But what else do you want to talk about with these guys? Boone Holiday, uh, our uh, horde agent in uh, Fort Bend County, uh -huh. one day just called me and uh, he asked me this question, why are all the roses looking so good in landscapes right now? Right now? And, 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 <laughs> and yeah, and, and not only our professional, you know, extension agent, Boone Holiday noticed this, I am in the... Uh, in a social media rose group, and everyone noticed the same thing that uh, why are the uh, the roses this year look extremely well? And I think, uh, and here's my take on it, and uh, Laura, and 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 I'll, I'll, I'll you know see what you're thinking. I think that 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 storm really did a nice work for for these roses. Basically, you know, if you think about the knockouts. Or, or the other, all the reblooming roses, it's, 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 they're tired. They're tired from all the blooming. It just, you know, all the flowering takes energy. So what that did is that it forced, hey, guys, uh, take a break. Just, just, just go dormant. Just take a break. Take a break. You know, the spring is, uh, this spring is going to be here uh, shortly. So I think that, 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 you know, that taking that break, uh, you know, that forced them to uh, shed all their leaves and stuff, just taking that break, you know, uh, you know, uh, taking a nap uh, that really helped them to coming back and all refreshing, they're all energized and, uh, you know, flowering their heart out. So that's right. my take. What's yours? 
So Becky put a comment in the chat. She said that they look nice next to all those dead Indian Hawthorns. And, and I would say that we are grateful that they are here for us and they look really good for, to us. So I, I would say that's another thing is that, you know, you're I'm just happy to see things flowering and they are doing their thing. But most of them are fairly cold hardy too, especially like the knockout, which was bred in Minnesota. You know, it's a it's a it was chosen, it was selected to be a cold hardy rose. So a lot of our a lot of our popular roses are they do have that in their genetics. And also roses are one of the most tinkered with plants in the world. You know, they just, there's a lot of components in there. You just never see a rose that doesn't have, that hasn't been selected for, for some qualities. And, you know, a lot of those selections were made for cold tolerance. So they are really, a lot of them pretty cold tolerant. Well, thank you. I, I just want to remind Dr. Becky Bolins that, uh, you know, she's got this mic on. She can talk. And <laughs> yeah, just, uh, <laughs> I just didn't want to interrupt you guys. Oh, no, well, you can talk. I like to make my little snarky comments about Indian Hawthorne and the comments. Yes, that that's, that's very true. That's that's <laughs> very true. And, and, and one thing is they're really nice. And also, you know, the contrast, contrast, you know, comparing to the dead ones next door. Yes, they are looking extremely mm -hmm. nice. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah, but I think the weather, the weather made them happy. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this next group are canes, uh, and I'll call them canes. Uh, you know, of course, it's it's easy to understand that these bamboos are canes. Uh, you know, they have they have only one uh, kind of you know each each stem or what you call a cane. It has only one uh, growing tip that's at the top. So. Uh, the uh, the nandinas, the all kinds of uh, nandinas with different foliar uh, uh, interests that are actually very similar to the uh, very similar to the uh, to the bamboos that they have these canes. And there was once I uh, remember talking to folks about you know why do the tissue culture? They say that you know because these canes you you cut off one to um, to. To root them, and then that cane is dead. You know, it's not going to grow anymore. So, and then from that cane, you you're not necessarily getting a hundred percent root in. So it's so so Nandina is Nandinas are uh, are one of few plants that's almost always done through tissue culture instead of uh, cuttings. Right. One of our few shrubs. All the cultivar ones are mostly tissue cultured. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, the yeah. old ones are still divided, but um, old ones yeah. still divided. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so for for these canes, uh, you know, unless that cane is dead or something, I I don't see. I I really don't see. Uh, uh, you know, too many reasons for uh for for pruning these, and then the um the the Japanese aurelia. Why did well, I put this the here? Other it's thing, not... I have I have a thing to say about Nandina too. If you just top it off, it will it will look ugly because it'll start it'll look like little feather dusters. You know, it'll send out a bunch of little shoots and then it'll have like kind of a bare stick with little foofy stuff on them. Not these new ones as much because they tend to stay low and you don't have to prune them. But if you have an old heavenly bamboo, like we call them, you need to take out some of the canes down at the base, you know, to if one is too tall, just go ahead and take it out. So I think yeah. heavenly bamboo may be the uh, the 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 literal um, translation from the Chinese name. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, because uh, they they are called heavenly bamboo in Chinese. I mean, really? you know the yeah, 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 yeah. Did not know that. Wow, we learned something. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that I think belongs in this category are our mahonias, like. Uh, soft caress mahonia is a popular one or just yeah. you know regular old um, mahonia they also form these kind of canes so what did you but, want to say about it no no I was just going to say the Japanese aurelias are not necessarily canes uh, it's it's not even uh, it, it, you know it's not even shrubby but you know it's it's uh it has these uh, stems that, you know, and, and mostly if you, you know, you see that they're just leaves. So if you cut off the top and you just see these long leaf sticks, uh, so uh, another reason for not uh, pruning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, conifers, um, what are some of the reasons for conifers? Uh, we mentioned in the previous uh, chat that uh, 
we talk about those Italian, you know, dying Italian Cypress uh, a couple of years ago in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And, and this year, you know, in, when that happens, when that happens, when those, uh, those fungal disease happens that, you know, part of that, you know, part of the uh, canopy look dead and with the rest is still hang on. Um, personally, I, I really don't think that's a, uh, that's, that's very slightly, that's, you know, aesthetically not pleasing, you know, and that could happen to, that could happen to, to a lot of the, the conifers, the, the junipers and stuff. So, so for the, for the, 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 the low, you know, the low growing ones, you know, you cut off one stem, it doesn't hurt the, the look that much. You know, uh, if there is any stem that's, that's diseased, you cut it off, it doesn't look that bad. But when it's on the, uh, on the very symmetrical looking the trees, when that happened, especially if that happened, you know, large areas of, uh, of, of that dead wood happens, it really affects the, the, the whole look. And that may be a time, uh, you know, just maybe just uh, take off the whole thing off the landscape. And the use, you know, is, is similar, but use are probably don't have that many fungal disease that the junipers uh, share. Are you guys ready for the meatballs? So, um, so in this, uh, in this is uh, the hollies and lookalikes. Um, so, uh, so we have some of the tree hollies, we have some of the, uh, the dwarf hollies, and then, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the mock orange, uh, you know, the lookalikes. Um, so uh, it really, uh, you know, like hollies, like hollies, uh, they, um, uh, we really use as hollies for mainly for three things, you know, uh, the fruits, but of course, before fruit, before fruit in, they gotta have flowers. Uh, a lot of them are flowering right now, and then with the fruits coming in in the fall. And also, they have these really tight growth habit. Just great for uh, yes, Laura, you. <laughs> they have these growth uh, tight growth habit that really great for screening. Uh, you know, for for privacy. Uh, the top of use, and you know, for like formal gardens with their uh, very symmetrical uh, growing. And, uh, and again, they are one of the things that, you know, could uh, tolerate uh, their, their pruning, shear intolerance that would just, you know, um, uh, make the plants uh, tighter, uh, you know, more uh, formal looking. And the Jacks, Japanese boxwood and mock orange, you know, the, the, depending on the leaf types, uh, you know, the mock orange definitely has much larger leaf, but could be, you know, grouped and pruned as, uh, as these uh, hollies. I would just say light shearing, uh, never do too hard uh, shearing, uh, just light shearing, but just get them to the shape that you want. And the uh, next uh, is the evergreens, uh, maybe, uh, you know, and when we don't have a, a cold winter, they're uh, evergreens, but if we have a hard one, they will uh, lose their, uh, they will lose their leaves. Um, Uh, red tip of Fotinia, they're actually flowering right now, but often we don't, uh, we don't appreciate their flowers as much as we appreciate the new growth. So a lot of times, you know, uh, these could be just sheared, uh, sheared back hardly, hard, uh, sheared back hard and, uh, you know, to get that uh, new flush of uh, new leaves, new red leaves. So shearing is, is okay on, on so many of these. Uh, when it comes to, you know, the dwarf, the dwarf wax myrtle, again, could be sheared, could be put in the neat amoeba stage, but the, but the, the native ones that, you know, the, the, the species itself, it's, um, uh, it may not, it's, it's a big, it's a, it's a huge shrub, it's a huge shrub. Again, you know, uh, prune off the dead woods, maybe what's needed. This is, this is, uh, this is a, a, a whole group of, uh, um, what we call shrubs, but they're not necessarily shrubs. They're they're used as you know in places as other shrubs, but they're not shrubs. So these are rosettes that you know they have basal leaves. So how what would you do? I mean, Laura, if you think about it, what would you what would we do to prune these, or do we or do we even prune these? So most of the time, no, you don't you don't even prune them. Um, this year, though, with some of the, especially some of the agaves are less cold hardy than others, so people had 
you know, leaves that died. Um, so and, prune off the dead parts. Dead parts, yeah. The dead parts. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think, I think, I think uh, hopefully our audience has uh, maybe come to a conclusion here that uh, most of the time I'm just telling you not to touch not them. Not to prune them. <laughs> not to prune them. I mean, this is... <laughs> <laughs> this is not to prune them it seems like is the uh, is the theme when we go through these different types of uh, uh unless of course you know for the dead parts like dr uh dr ong said you know it doesn't matter how uh how how much green pain you're gonna apply on them you know they're you're not gonna bring them back so those definitely a, a reason for uh, um, i think that's one of the reasons these are so popular um in landscapes is that you don't really have to do much to them if they get established and live they're kind of just doing their thing yeah so. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we are seeing more and more fruits uh you know fruit plants in in uh in landscapes uh especially in residential landscapes and if your uh, client is asking you you know why are my fruits uh, not fruiting i i'm not a, a, a fruit specialist we actually have fruit specialists uh, uh, on uh, you know, um, you know, producing fruits, but I do have some experience with some of the fruits. Uh, in this case, the low quad, the pomegranate, this one is not, I don't have a name for it, but it's a pomegranate, you know, one of our uh, IPM, uh, one of our program specialists is working on pineapple guava, you know, I love low quads, so stuff like these. So um, if your client is very interested in the fruiting part, um, like for this one, you know, pomegranate is, is very weedy and for them to not waste a whole lot of uh, energy on, on vegetative growth, if you want them to flower and fruit. So, you know, uh, cutting off uh, a lot of these, uh, these, these woods, these stems, just let them focus more on the, um, more on the uh, reproductive growth. So if I, if I am the uh, professional, landscape professional hired to do this job to make my client's pomegranate fruit more, you know, uh, than this, you know, I, what I would do is probably just leave maybe two to three cane, two to three major stems, and then just, you know, and then uh, prune off all the others. Just uh, otherwise it's just wasting this energy. It's a similar story to the low quad here. It's a similar story to the low quad here. You want it to, to focus on a few, you know, just a few uh, fruit and stems, uh, just so that you will get the, the big and juicy fruits. Uh, so uh, we talk about in, in uh, on February the 4th, we talked about some of the reasons for, uh, for pruning uh, trees. So I just want to throw it out there that uh, you know it's in our uh, it's in our chat with the Green Aggie, it's in our uh, chat with the Green Aggie uh, playlist. That you are always welcome to go back and see, and the the recording of this one will also be available there. Um, so this is a uh, make a plea uh, that uh, you know well, please everyone um, you know. Um, help us you know give us some feedback uh that will help us to uh to go forward it's uh sixlegaggies.com slash chat survey i think everyone oh somebody I just put, put it in yeah the... just put it in the chat as well so that people can okay, just click thank that you, link thank it's you. a bit thank easier you for... or you can use your phone to scan that qr code and uh, also take you right there okay but you do have okay thank you you do have the link in the uh in in the chat correct yeah i just put it in the chat okay that's great so should so should i uh tell everyone what we're gonna have in may and june are we ready for that yes we are yes we are <laughs> thank you thank you so in may uh in may and june um you know uh we have all these uh topics line up in may you know again um there are four weeks in May, four weeks in June. I mean, not the four, four Thursdays in May, four Thursdays in June. So for it's, it's you know, the first week, arboriculture, second week, uh, turf grass, third week, nursery and lands, no greenhouse, and the fourth week is landscape. So um, yeah, uh, and it's the same uh, registration link, uh, sixleggedaggie.com slash 
CWGA that stands for Chat with the Green Aggies. So um, we welcome you to uh, register for one or all our uh, events uh, in May and June. Anything else that our panelists want to add? Nope. Maybe just another reminder that next week is um, kind of a special edition the Bring It, Bring It Growers. And we are asking you, if possible, so we did this with kind of the winter recovery webinars. We're asking people to submit their questions ahead of time. We'd be able to better prepare to answer them. And you can do so through the survey link in the chat. Uh, here, let me put bring it growers questionnaire extraordinaire. Airphone, this is a uh, professional exclusive, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a professional right. exclusive. And when what's the definition of professional? If this is your career, we're asking, you know, personnel, this is your career, you're a uh, career grower or a landscape professional. Again, it is your main career because we want to help, uh, you know, the, 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 the purpose of this program. I mean, we could spend, uh, you know, all time of all day of every day answering questions um, of a very specific home, home garden questions or uh, urban gardening questions. And we have a really good group that also deals with that, uh, the Aggie Hort group on Facebook that, that we encourage you to check out. But we are trying to uh, help specifically the green industry growers. So uh, growers and, and landscapers and professionals. So uh, please fill out that survey with your um, you know, uh, challenges in, in your business um, related to, um, and, and we will get to them next week. And I would just, I would just say too that if you're watching this and you are a professional that that any of us work at, work with individually and you would feel more comfortable reaching out to us via email um, to maybe propose some topics or make some suggestions, maybe that's just more comfortable for you than Qualtrics, um, please don't hesitate. You know, many of us have yep. different relationships with, with you guys. And so we're all open to just hearing from you directly on questions, comments, concerns, things that you'd like us to talk about um, or ideas that you might have, so. And then next week, is it uh, open mic? <laughs> we'll do open mic until uh, yeah. until yes. something happens where we might have to make it not open mic. <laughs> we're going to do, okay. do improv, okay. actually, at the beginning. Just improv yeah, exactly. related yeah. to. <laughs> improv games, uh, so we yes. get to know each other. <laughs> yes, and yes. Perfect. All right. All right. <laughs> I really appreciate you all, you know, y'all's attention and also, you know, uh, you're tuning in every week or one of the weeks, uh, just just um, anytime hang out uh, with us. Uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, yes, I guess have a great afternoon and see you all uh, next week. Hey, can we can Thank we you. meet real Ooh. quick? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're going to Air Fun's right, room. Take care. Yes, We're going go to, to my room. room. <laughs>